Hello, hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Please take a moment uh, to take a deep breath and join us in this space. We're wearing our fall foliage today. Just take a moment to listen to some nature sounds as we let this waterfall of 222 and climbing people join us in this moment. If you can please mute yourself for the moment, we greatly appreciate it. Okay, well, let's get started. I want to say hello, bonjour, hola, wait, guess quiet. My name is Jade Harvey Beryl, and I'm a part of the team at the Outdoor Learning Store. We're a North American wide charitable social enterprise that offers outdoor learning equipment and resources for educators and learners while supporting outdoor learning nonprofits. I also work closely with Take Me Outside, they're our partner in delivering this workshop. I'm joining you today from the interior of British Columbia, a place called what we now call Revelstoke. Um, that for the Sinaixt people who've called this home for millennia is uh, Skihikan, where the ridge lines meet the water and we have the Monashis and the Selkirks meeting the Columbia River. So it's very fitting. This is also a place that's been known and stewarded by the Sequetnik, the Tanaha and the Okanogan Silks people. So for us, the it, in the context of outdoor learning, it is fundamental to develop uh, our understanding of traditional ecological knowledge and perspectives and take time to nurture relationships with the indigenous people who've called this place home for millennia. And um, so if it's relevant to you, please um, take a moment to share in the chat the indigenous territory you're joining from today. If you don't know uh, whose traditional and unceded territory you're on, uh, you can visit native-land.ca, it, it covers the entire globe, uh, to learn more. And this is a great starting place to build relationships with your local Indigenous First Nations or Native groups. So I'll just let that happen for a moment. Thanks, Jade, and I'll take a moment to introduce myself here. Um, my name is Stephanie, I'm from Take Me Outside, I'm the program coordinator there. And on behalf of our organization and our 50 plus now outdoor learning partners, we're really excited to be here um, this afternoon or evening, wherever you're, you're uh, listening in from. It's lovely to see everybody here. Um, it's always such a great, great time with these workshops. So I'm joining in from Vancouver Island in British Columbia, and it is the traditional territory of the Kowatsin people, the Cowichan tribes, uh, and the Holcomenum speaking peoples who stewarded this land that I now uh, live, work, and play on. And uh, it's wonderful to see everybody in the chat contributing there. So thank you. Oh, and Jade, you're muted there. I see you're trying to <laughs> continue on. Thank you so much. Um, so the last few years have been, you know, pretty intense. Part of the reason I'm, I'm wearing all of this foliage is because this is what I can help to help create energy and, and enthusiasm for myself. Um, we've all had a, a tough time, um, but, you know, to see 288 people on the line here, uh, sharing in knowledge and growth for the importance of outdoor learning for our physical and mental health and the deeper real world learning opportunities that it offers um, we thank you we thank you for your passion we thank you for your time and this uh, really gives us hope um, and these virtual workshops help us reach people who are underrepresented or perhaps uh, living more remotely uh, so we are so pleased to have each and every one of you here thank you for joining bit of Zoom 101 for you, the chat's down there for you to use. Please type any questions you might have for Jacob or us into that chat box and Stephanie and one of our other supporting Duncan are gonna be there to collect them and we're gonna pose them to Jacob at the end. Please mute yourself uh, until asked otherwise, but please mute yourself because that just helps uh, keep everything focused for the moment. You can leave your video on, it's lovely to present to faces. Um, I've enabled uh, the tr live transcription 
Um, if that doesn't work for you, you can find the more three dots button and um, turn that off for yourself. And okay, we're going to start with a very short intro. I'm just going to share about our partners for a moment. We're going to have Jacob's fantastic presentation, a Q&A with Jacob, and then prizes. So stay right to the end because you won't want to miss that. You can access the recording to this, a discount code to the store, and your certificate of attendance via a link that will be emailed to you shortly after the workshops. Please check your spam folder if you don't get them by 12 o'clock because they are there. Okay, to get things started, I just want to ask a couple of questions. And so this first one, I asked about your Indigenous acknowledgement, but this poll is where are you joining us from? Um, and you can scroll if you don't see your answer there. I'm just going to give it five more seconds. Let people come on in. Five, four, three, two, one. I'm going to end the poll and share those results. Results. We have somewhere everywhere except Mexico this time. We have people represented, and that just shows you how fantastic the diversity of people joining is. Uh, I'm so pleased uh, that you've all come and going through different time zones and things. But more importantly, who are you? Are you a formal educator, early childhood? What age are you? Admin or support? Are you informal? Are you a parent or none of these and you're just passionate about outdoor education and nature and wanted to share with us? Again, I'm just going to let it just for a couple of moments. What are we watching? Just being outside. Yeah. Just get a little mute party there. Okay, and five, four, three, two, one. I'm going to end the poll there and share those results. Okay, it, every single group has somebody representing. So it's interesting to see, you know, lots of different age groups there, many early childhoods. I hope we have something for everything, uh, for everyone there as part of today's presentation. Okay, I'm just really quickly, very quickly going to introduce you and thank you for joining us for the outdoor learning full virtual workshop series today is october 4th and we are joined uh, by jake and rodenberg for nature connections sensory activities for all ages i just wanted to share really briefly we have some incredible international partners and if you go to the link that you'll find in the chat now then um you'll be able to click on a link that takes you to the website. There are amazing offerings of resources and support um, that you can find there. This is our international team. This is our United States team. So many opportunities to learn, grow, get involved. And these are our Canada-wide partners too. Over 50 that we have curated at this point, all for you. But now let's get on with the main event. And I would love to welcome author and nature sommelier, Jacob Rodenberg. He is an award-winning educator and executive director of Camp Kawatha, which is also award-winning. Uh, it's a summer camp and outdoor education center. Uh, he's an instructor in environmental education uh, at Trent University as well. He's an outdoor teacher with over 30 years experience. He's got a master's in education. He's gonna probably talk about what he is a nature sommelier at some point or if not you can check out our podcast where we interviewed him and he spoke about that in great detail um jacob has taught more than a hundred thousand students and he is the co-author of the big book of uh, nature activities up here and the book of nature connection which is kind of what we're focusing on today jacob lives in peterborough ontario and uh we just want to welcome you thanks for joining us jacob it's over to you hey thanks so much jade so nice to have everybody joining us today. And because it's about connection, why don't you reach your arms out and we can virtually connect the people beside down below. Let's see if we can make a virtual connection. Can we do that? Wonderful. All right, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll see what happens. Um, can everybody see this? Jade? We can. I'm just still seeing your whole screen. I'll let you know when it goes. There we are. You're into presentation mode. Wonderful. Well, one of the things I thought we'd start off doing is I love wolves. And to hear wolves 
howl in the middle of the night on some far-flung lake is a beautiful experience. And I thought we could simulate that right here, right now. And wolves howl because they wanna know where other packs are. They howl to find out where individual wolves are, or maybe they howl for the same reason humans sing, just for the sheer joy of it. So let's listen for one second to a wolf howling. Nice, here's the way it works. Usually the alpha wolf, often the female, lifts her tail in the air and lets loose with a big howl. Then another wolf joins in, they duet together. And then the other adult wolves join them and then the puppies come in. So what I'm thinking, Jay, you can join with me together and we'll duet for a bit. And whoever wants to can unmute and become an adult wolf. And if you want to take on the extra challenge of being a puppy wolf, they don't have fully developed vocal cords, so they sound like this. So, um, Jade, I'm gonna start, and we're gonna pretend that we're on the shores of a lake in Northern Ontario. You can hear the wind. The great horned owl calls from a tree. Who's awake? Me too. And breaking the silence is a wolf, and that's me. Joined by Jade. Ooh. Joined by anyone else who wants to. Oh. And that, oh. You did a great job. Hundreds of people howling from all over North America. A bit of howl therapy, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to mute everyone and then uh, ask you to unmute again, Jacob. I'm going to ask you to unmute there for a moment, Jacob. Sorry, I had to mute everyone to reset. Thank you, Jade. <laughs> I'm hoping in this presentation you'll learn a little bit more about how to activate all your senses so you can have a more full-bodied connection to the natural world that we're privileged to be part of. And to do that, I'm going to take a little break here. Oh, I'm trying to advance my slide, which is not working. Uh, there you go. And Jacob, we, we can, sorry, we can see the, or I can see the Zoom um, bar across your slide and it's blocking it a little bit. Oh, that's odd. It is odd, yeah. I'm not sure why that is. I think you can click and drag it and it should be able to drag off your screen. Okay, well, let's just see. If... My apologies, everyone. There are some people that are really good at uh, technology and that's not me. Does and that you're, that's that's much better. Yeah, that's that's up and mostly out of the way. Well, I'm just going to take a break here, have a glass of wine. I don't know if you can see this, but there we go. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. Here's to Cheers. a beautiful day. It is here in Ontario anyway, a beautiful day. But you know, People who appreciate wine are called sommeliers, and they get good at appreciating wine because they practice it. What do they do? They pour themselves and they look at the color and they might say, oh, that's ruby and robust. They might take a smell and say, ooh, that smells earthy and foxy. They might roll it on their tongue like this. And say, that's chewy. They appreciate wine because they've engaged all their senses from the smell to the touch on their tongue, to the taste, to the feel. I wish we could do that with nature. Maybe we can become nature sommeliers where we literally drink the natural world in. And in doing so, we feel more connected. I have a theory. My theory is that because people are spending so much time on screens where the world is hermetically sealed in two dimensions and they're really only activating their sense of sight and their sense of sound, that they're missing that connection with nature. And as a result, maybe they feel a little lonely. We all yearn to belong to our families and our friends, but I think it's part of us that yearns to belong to nature too. So by opening up our senses, drinking the natural world in, we feel more complete, more part of the beautiful natural systems that nourish us. And we can think about our connections with nature as being a relationship. And like any relationship, it takes mindfulness, intention, hard work, commitment, exercising gratitude, and I want you to think about that when it comes to going out into nature. 
think of that, finding a place that you can take yourself or your kids or your students over and over again. So you build a sense of intimacy with them. Think about personalizing the landscape. My wife, Jessica, runs a little Waldorf-based school and she, there are rocks there. She calls the grandfather rock. There's trees with hearts in them, heart-shaped holes that she calls the heart tree. By doing that, she ends up personalizing the landscape and deepening the connection between children and, and the land. One of the stories I love to tell is, is a friend of mine who's a principal. And one day he was walking to school and the kids said, hey, mister, there's a bird and it's on the, on the parking lot. And it was skittering along and being a wise principal, he said, hey, I wonder what kind of bird it is, even though he knew. Well, he helped the kids look it up. It turned out it was a killdeer. And when they looked even closer, that killdeer had made a little nest right in the parking lot or speckled eggs. Of course, the kids got worried that it would get run over, so they put pylons up. And after a while, they made sure nothing ran over it. And the wise principal gave them each binoculars. And over time, they watched how those eggs hatched out. They watched how Mama Killdeer bravely fed them. But after a while, there's no way they would have let anything ever happen to that Killdeer and, and to the little babies. The babies fled successfully and left. They built a relationship with that Killdeer and they would have done anything to protect it. So maybe what our job is as educators is to try to build those intimate connections with kids and the landscape. We are here in, at least I am, this beautiful area called Kawartha Lakes. And it's the Anishinaabe who are the traditional um, caretakers of the land. They have this wonderful word called Anikana which means all my relations. To them, trees aren't objects, rocks aren't objects. They're part of their family. And that's a, a lovely way to look at the natural world as being part of your neighbor wood, your community. As much as the buildings, houses, and trees are, you're surrounded by living neighbors that merit being treated with respect. So if you can, go out tomorrow, redeem the day, and just find a quiet spot. Sit down and focus on the sounds that sweep through the trees. Breathe slowly in and out. What is the smell of this place? Take your fingers and tickle the grass or feel the soil and smell what the soil smell like. Look around and note the many shades of green and brown and gold that are happening. At least here, autumn is well underway. So let's go through some of our senses and find out a little bit about how it works and maybe some activities that help us practice sensory awareness, much like the sommelier. So we are blessed with the eyes of a predator. That's right, test it out, close one eye, take your two fingers and stretch them out and see if you can touch the tips of your fingers together. A little hard, you lost your stereoscopic vision. Open both of them and it's easier. That's because one eye is placed in a slightly different position than the other, and you can kind of triangulate with your vision depth. A rabbit has eyes on the side of its head, so it's really good peripheral vision. Ours are a bit more limited. To test that out, take your two fingers, put them on the side of your head, wriggle them. How far back can you see them? But here's something I'd like you to try as a sensory experience. See if you can find a leaf. If there's a leaf within reach, grab it. And you wonder about the famous detective Sherlock Holmes. He was always able to solve mysteries. Watson, his sidekick, would sometimes ask Sherlock, Sherlock, how did you do it? How did you solve that murder? To which Sherlock would reply, my dear Watson, you see, but you do not notice. So my leaf that I have here, what, I'm gonna ask you to do, if, if you could have a leaf and, and put it in your fingers and take a look at it, is, is just use the following statement. I notice that. I notice that this leaf is pointed at the end. I notice that there's little tiny serrations or little teeth. I notice that different colors on one side than the other. I, I notice the veins run parallel. I also notice that the stem is, is not entirely round. What do you notice? Next, after noticing, of course, you can wonder. 
I wonder why is my leaf green? I wonder why do leaves turn color in the fall? I wonder why this leaf is um, just got a smooth edge on one side and, and little pointies on the other. I wonder what's going to happen to my leaf. And the last thing you can do in the sequence with, with kids is say, it reminds me of. Oh, this leaf reminds me on how, how ephemeral autumn is and how the leaves will fall and eventually turn into soil and snow will come. But the good news is buds will form next year and there'll be new leaves. You think about it, the engine of learning is curiosity and curiosity comes from wondering. And we as educators can help to spur on curiosity by helping kids ask wonder questions and taking it seriously and helping them to find the answer to those wonder questions. The more we observe and help kids observe, the more we'll generate those wonder questions, the more we'll generate curiosity, and the more they'll find out about the world around them, which is an amazing place. So what made that fall of leaves up in the tree? What made that hole in the tree? There's answers to every one of those questions. You just have to find out. Now, some questions kids will have that we don't know the answers to yet, and that's maybe where as future scientists, they can help discover the answer. Oh, how many times have I seen parents say, yuck, oh, put that down, Johnny, that's dirty. Like this rat-tailed maggot, which I find fascinating. We just have to be really careful about how we speak about nature. We can sometimes shut it down by saying, oh, come on, put that down, that's dirty. Or we can maybe reframe things to increase the sense of wonder. One, one thing I love to do is go to a wetland and then I might say to kids, hey, do you wanna see an underwater jet propelled jaw thrusting bug snatcher? Who wouldn't wanna see one of those? But it turns out that's a baby dragonfly and you can catch them in a net. Baby dragonflies spend the first part of their life under the water. They suck water in through their mouth and shoot it out their rear end. They have this folding jaw called a labium where they can catch little bugs. And that's cool. Now you can have fun with that. Maybe you can find a wind soaring acorn gobbler, which is a flying squirrel or green faced, sweet smelling sun catcher. There, that's a cedar tree. Now, are you like me when you go for a walk in the forest? Do you look at your feet because you don't want to trip? That's okay, but sometimes you'll miss so much that's around you. So you can help kids and yourself practice splatter vision. That means you look straight ahead, you look down, you look over your shoulders, you look back. And by splattering your vision, you're more likely to see things. One thing I love doing is hiding stuff along a trail. We've got this wonderful bird walk where we've hidden metal birds up in the trees and we see how many kids can discover or sometimes I hide little insects, little plastic insects. Try a hand frame, take your one hand, and extend the thumb down, take your other hand, flip it the other way and extend the thumb up and join them together. You've got a frame. Sometimes just by isolating parts of nature, you begin to appreciate it in a new way. And with that in mind, you can create your own frames. Take some popsicle sticks and glue them together or tongue depressors. Use clothespins and get kids to pin them up against beautiful scenes or lay them on the ground or have a clothesline and use clothespins to hang them on a clothesline over a beautiful view. Hey, try the green sheen challenge. You wouldn't believe how many different colors of green there are out there in nature. And see if you can find an exact match. It's harder than you think. We, our eyes, have, are packed with three million cones. Those are specially shaped um, receptors that can pick up red, green, and blue light. And by blending them together, we see over a million different shades of color. And if you don't tune in to the shades, it just becomes a green blur and we tend to ignore it. But those green, that green blur can resolve itself into an, a pine tree or a fir tree or an oak tree. In the book that I wrote called The Book of Nature Connections, you'll, you'll find some sensory color wheels for each of the seasons. And, and the challenge is, can you find something that exactly matches and clip it on with a clothespin? And you can appreciate that every season has its own signature colors and its own feel. You can try explaining about camouflage. 
You know, when light falls on an object, it tends to be darker underneath and lighter on top. So animals tend to be colored the opposite, darker on top and lighter on the bottom, like that deer down below. That's called counter shading. And other types of camouflage from mimicry, where you've got walking stick that looks like a stick, or concealment camouflage, like that owl tucked in the hole of a tree, hardly hard pressed to see. What I love doing is taking pictures of, let's say, native species. I get them from the internet and I laminate them and I get the kids to try to hide them to see if they can blend right in as best they can. It's harder than I often do this game and then I'm missing half of them because they can't find them again. Or camouflage eggs. A lot of ground nesting birds like the killdeer we spoke about, like turkeys and, and grouse lay their eggs on the ground and they're colored in camouflage. So in the spring, I, I love to boil up brown eggs, get the kids to see if they can mimic some of the patterning that birds really do, make a nest and then hide their egg. Sometimes I ask the kids, hey, do you want to find um, an earth boring submarine? Do you want to find a shapeshifter? Do you want to find a baby dragon? Come, go for a walk. I say, hey, that log over there, that's a window. Let's carefully lift it up and see what's underneath. That rock, that's a window too. That we lift it up, we see what we can find. We look at it, always careful to put it back at the end. And the baby dragons are kind of like salamanders, of which we have a lot of. Earth boring submarine, that, that's an earthworm. And they tend to bore through the soil and bring air into the soil and aerate it. And their poo called frass helps to um, fertilize the soil. And then you've got shapeshifters, pill bugs that can cut themselves into a tiny pill. I always do a critter release poem at the end. Crawl away, fly away, swim away, leap. You're free to go on. You are not going to keep you from living your life. You're meant to be free. Thank you for sharing this time with me. Oh, nature sculpting. You ever want kids to appreciate the colors, the textures, the patterns of nature? Show the work of Andy Goldsworthy. You can find him online. And he is an artist who hails from Great Britain. He goes out into nature just with his hands creates these beautiful sculptures, he takes a picture, and then lets nature reclaim it. And if you show kids his work, they get inspired. Here's one that our kids did, and they come up with some really neat things. I'm always mindful, though, that if we're taking something from nature, we need to do our best to respect and to give back. So the work of Robin Wall Kimmerer she talks about the honorable harvest, which is a First Nations principle. You don't pick the first one. You don't pick the last one. You always ask permission. You take just a bit from here, a bit from there. You're always expressing gratitude. And you give back wherever you can. Hey, in the fall, I love taking mushrooms. Just a cap, putting them on a piece of white paper. And I put a glass jar over it and I let the spores fall. Maybe it takes 24 hours, the glass jar. It's just to make sure the spores don't get swept by any wind currents. And it'll make a lovely and beautiful spore print. You can harvest berries. I use buckthorn berries, which is an invasive species. And I crush it and I mix it with a bit of vinegar and I put it through a filter and it makes a great ink. And I use that to make drawings with kids. I use raspberries, blueberries, all kinds of things and ways you can make beautiful homemade ink. And you can make natural paint brushes too, just by grabbing whatever is soft and fluffy in nature and tying it to a twig. And you can make some really interesting patterns with that. Um, crow trails, a really quick story. I love taking my kids for a hike when they were young. We went up to the top of this tall, tall hill there. We could see for miles and miles, but my kids were looking at the ants at their feet. Little kids have a more contracted view of the environment. So they teach us to honor and to pay attention to the very small. So create a micro trail. Just get some popsicle sticks and some yarn, 
And at a point of interest, stick your popsicle stick in, tie the yarn around it, and go to the next spot a few steps away. So maybe it is a cool hole in the ground with spider's web, or maybe it's a chewed leaf, who knows, but you can create a magnificent trail. I love this, such a simple activity in the fall. Take a clothespin, put a child's name on it, and pin it to a leaf. Go back the next day, take a picture in the next day and see how it changes over time. Kids will delight in how quickly things change. Japanese viewing party can be done any time of the year. Han hanami, you just have a little glass of wine if you're an adult or, or juice if you're a kid, and you just sit and you watch something for an extended period of time. Maybe you're watching a leaf blow in the wind. Maybe you're watching a bug crawl along the ground, or maybe you're watching a flower unfurling. Hearing the world, and I'm mindful of the fact that we've only gone through one sense and I don't have tons of time. Take your two hands, cup them together, do that right now. Put them behind your ears and push forward. Do that, you can hear 10 times better. So many wonderful sounds. You can even try Jacob's homemade patented handy dandy ear catchers, which I made out of just some stiff cardboard and, and some dowel. It's amazing how much better you can hear. Maybe you, you can practice satiricism, which is a great word. Throw that out at a cocktail party. But satiricism is the sound that wind makes as it brushes against the leaves of a tree. So an oak sounds differently from a pine, which sounds differently from a trembling aspen. Can you recognize the type of tree by just listening to the way the wind plays through the branches? Try it. Or when you're with kids and you're listening to a difference, close your eyes. And any time a child hears a different sound, they put up a finger. And at the end, you ask, well, how many fingers do you have on? What, what did you hear? And you can compare. Or you can make a sound map where you're drawing the different sounds you're hearing in the different directions and, and comparing. One of my favorites, bird whispering. You know, sometimes it's really hard to remember the sound that birds make. But one way to do it is it's called mnemonics. You put a little saying to it. So I'm going to give an example. That's the sound of a morning dove. I remember that. But there's nothing. Cardinal. Cheer, cheer, party, party. Different birds have different sounds and different mnemonics. And to help you, I've got one right here and I'm gonna invite you in a moment to unmute and pick one of those birds and then do its saying. So for example, the white-breasted nuthatch, in fact, wink, 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 wink. Um, the black-capped chickadee. They call at different times. So for example, Song Sparrow calls from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. and from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. So what I want you to do is pay attention to the time because in a moment, I'm gonna tell a very quick story and you need to listen to the time and start to call when that time is called. So for example, if I said one in the morning, not very many people would call. But if I said six in the morning, suddenly you would do your call. So pick one. Let's try unmute, and I'm going to do a really quick walk through a day in the forest. It's a true story. I can't sleep. I'm an insomniac. So one night, I grabbed my backpack, and off I went. By that time, it was 3 o'clock in the morning, and I could see the stars twinkling overhead, a loon calling from a distant lake. Before I knew it, it was five o'clock in the morning. The first rays of dawn began. So six o'clock in the morning. Who's away? My day was really quickly. Threw off my sweater. It was getting warm. And at eight o'clock in the morning, the sun began to arc its way towards the south. And at nine o'clock in the morning, I heard all kinds of birds at 10 o'clock in the morning. The sound began to dampen at 11 o'clock in the morning. I had a bite of my food. At 12 o'clock noon, I sat down and had a nap. Before I knew it, it was two in the afternoon. I started to get that beautiful stretching of shadows at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the light started to get warm. At 4 o'clock, 
I had enough, as beautiful as the day was. I went home and I went to church. Cheerity, 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 cheerity. Thank you, everybody. So, did, you hear, did you hear the pulse of the forest? How in the morning the birds call more, and late in the afternoon, but not so much in the middle of the day? You can try that activity with kids. I've muted you again, Jacob. I'm sorry. I have muted all. I only lost one word there. Oh, you're still muted, though. Sorry, Jacob. Please unmute. I know, I just keep, it's, you just have so much passion and joy and you're going, um, but I did have to encourage everyone else to mute. Um, that yeah. was incredible, by the way, um, and yeah, quite wild. <laughs> like, yes. yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Carry on. I'll be quiet now. Yeah, no, no worries. So in the springtime, you could actually hear sap rising if you use a stethoscope. You choose a tree that might be a foot in diameter. Maples work wonderfully, sugar maples. You can hear the bubbling, um, the, the rattling. Just watch and hear life come back to the tree. And I'm pressing my advanced button. It doesn't seem to be working. Oh, there we go. Hey, um, leaves are amazing. A mature tree can transpire, let water vapor out. 3,000 liters in one day. Prove that. Take a transparent plastic bag and tie it around a leaf in the spring and early summer and come back a few hours later and you'll watch it fill with water. You could try leaf chromatography in the fall where you take green leaves and you crush them in a blender with some rubbing alcohol and just stick a coffee filter in and you'll watch all the pigments that were there all along migrate up the leaf. So you've got the yellows, which are exanophils, the anthocyanins, which are the red, carotenoids, which are the orange, they all migrate at different levels. So you can show that those are there all along, masked by the green, which begins to die off in the fall. I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that I just like to emphasize the importance of the lessons that trees can teach us. Uh, trees can teach us that just by virtue of being there, you can do Trees do more good than harm. They uptake carbon, they give out oxygen, they aerate the soil, they transfer and moisten the air. So I wonder if we could live our lives like trees. You know, like every day, can we just give more than we take? Can, can we do more good than harm? Uh, trees are a wonderful thing to remind us about how rooted we can be to the earth if we choose to be. One of the things we're working on are, are, are building one of Canada's first living buildings which is just emulating the architecture of a tree and creating buildings that produce more energy than they use, that take water from the rain instead of taking it from an aquifer or a lake or use non-toxic materials that return back to the soil that have more nature around them after they're built than before they're built, a new way to live. Oh, what a wonderful world of smells we're privileged to be part of. Try this, take a sponge and dampen your upper lip. And by doing that, the moistness of the air enhances your sense of smell. And just go and rub and sniff things. Create a smell cocktail, which is a little glass, and you take a little soil, a few flowers, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Use a stick as a swivel stick and crush it all up and then give it a name. Maybe you call it Petaltopia or Forest Magic. You can even lay down scent trails. So take different extracts, like mint extract and almond extract and maple extract, and drizzle a few drops every few steps, and then hide a little mint and see if kids can follow that. Make it sweeping so you don't make it easy. And just like a fox, kids will move their noses back and forth, honing in on the scent. Create a sensory garden by planting different plants that have different smells, different textures. Um, here are some things that we've really had success with. Lovage, lemon balm, anise, mullein, garden sorrel. But we have a wonderful sensory garden that kids are in all the time, sniffing and rubbing. The edible wild, yes. There's lots we can do there. 
you have to be careful and never give a child something that you haven't tasted first. But you can make things like cedar tea and pine tea and wonderful juice out of uh, sumac berries. To find out more, um, you can look that up online, but just be really sure before you give anything to a child. And lastly, touching nature. You know, crammed in our fingertips are Mesner's corpuscles. We were born to touch and feel the world around us. We can, you know, sense the tiniest, softest touch of a leaf to uh, a thorn. One easy thing I love to do is take a feely blanket. So what I do is I lay a blanket on the ground. I get kids to run out and grab things with different textures and hide them under the blanket. And we lay down and we slide our hands under the blanket and see if we can guess what it is just by feeling. Or take a pillowcase and throw in pine cones and bones. No tarantulas, no, um, but yeah, see if they can reach into the bag and recognize what's there just by using their fingers. Try a blindfold trail where you put up a blindfold in an area that you know is um, safe and it doesn't have too many um, bushes and, and sticks to run into. Can, if it's safe enough and you want to take a shoe off, one barefoot, one shoe on, and just walk from spot to spot and feel the different textures underfoot. Feel how the, if it's a sunny day, how you much warmer with the feet on the soil and the splashes of sunlight, much cooler in the forest. Try my touch scavenger hunt. Can they find some of those things that's in the book? Something fuzzy, something silky, something light, something soft. Take off your shoes and just feel the energy of the earth coursing through your body. In the book also, there is some gratitude and some little statements that maybe help us to appreciate this natural world that we're privileged to be part of. You know, thank you, son, for flooding the world with your brightness, your energy, and your warmth. Thank you, birds. I admire your diversity, your ability to hide among the plant world, your diligence as you gather food and care for your young. The trillions. Now, these aren't all the senses we humans have. We have proprioception, which is knowing where we are in space and time, thirst, hunger. But maybe you're a synesthesiast. Synesthesia, that's where we blend different colors. Well, some people can actually hear colors. Um, they can see sound. Maybe you're one of those people. Maybe we can practice that. I, I know I've gone over my half hour. For that, I apologize. Maybe it's worthwhile telling a really quick story, and I will. A little boy wandering along a beach, he saw thousands of starfish that a high tide had strewn up on the beach. They were drying out, curling in the sun. There was an older man watching the little boy getting more and more irritated because the boy was picking up starfish and one after the other, tossing them back in the sea. You can picture it with arcing and splashing. And the boy kept going. And after a while, the man went up to the boy and said, what are you doing? Can't you see there are thousands of starfish? What difference can it possibly make? Then the boy reached down and grabbed the starfish, flung it out to sea. And he said, makes a difference to that one. Yeah, each of us in our own small way can make differences and together they can create great change. One of my favorite poems I'm gonna end with is from Diane Ackerman. I won't read the whole thing, but it's worth looking at. In the name of the sun and, yes? Read, read the whole thing. Okay, Sorry. if I have time. In the day you have the, time. All right, in the name of the daybreak and the eyelids of the morning and the wayfaring moon, and the night when it departs, in the name of the sun and its mirrors, and the day that embraces it, and the cloud veils drawn over it, and the uttermost night, and the plants bursting with seed, and the crowning seasons of the firefly and the apple, I will honor all life, wherever and whatever form it may dwell, on earth my home, and of my stars, of the stars. Thank you for your good sense in joining me to explore different ways we can use our senses to connect more deeply to nature. I, I love connecting with people. Feel free to email me anytime if you want to ask for resources and ideas or you want to share some, I'd be happy to hear about it. Um, I have some different videos I put together called Nature Notes. Explore that if you want. And if you want to check out the books, please do.
and I would encourage you to buy them from the Outdoor Learning Store. And that's all I have for you today, and my apologies for going longer. Never apologize for something like that, please. <laughs> that was absolutely wonderful. Uh, I can only speak for myself, but what an absolute just myriad adventure of all the senses. And someone who does a lot of these virtual things, and for all of us who have spent a lot of time in the virtual space, to be able to stimulate senses like that in this kind of environment is quite incredible. And I think that that speaks to your true and deep connection to the way that, that our bodies work and the way that we connect with things. So I am so very grateful for you for that. Um, the wolf, wolf howling was amazing. The story that's, you know, punctuated by all these bird calls was just absolute magic. I mean, crazy and wild, um, but absolute magic. So thank you so much. Uh, and I, you know, feel like there were an enormous amount of resources there for people to take. Um, and as somebody who uses both of your books very frequently in my own environment and education work, uh, they're all as, as easy to grasp as that. You just give things and you just keep giving. And I'm so grateful. Um, so anyone questions, please type them in the chat and we'll work through and see how we go. Um, could just listen to you talk forever, but that is a sentiment that was shared in the chat many times. Um, but Monique asks, can you please talk about the frog, frog slide? You skipped it or, you, or it got skipped while you were muted because I muted you again. Yeah, frogs are bioindicators. And here in Ontario, we have a number of different species, but each has their own unique call. Like the green frog goes, toads go, the wood frog. So what I do is I create a bit of a frog symphony where I'm the frog conductor and then different kids play different roles and I make them go louder and softer. And then you're really emulating what a wetland sounds like in the spring. And frogs, and I forgot to tell you this, same with birds, they call because they're looking for a mate or, you know, say, hey, translated from frog to English. Hey, I'm a boy frog. If you're a girl frog of my type, come on over. But if you're another boy frog, back off. So that's what they're doing. And um, if you hear lots of frogs, you know it's a healthy wetland because they breathe through their skin. And if there's pollutants and toxins, frog populations tend to crash. So I, you can go to frogwatch.ca, which is a, a Canadian website that teaches you the different sounds. And there's citizen science sites where you can go and report on the frogs you hear. Awesome. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Um, okay, um, Vanessa asks, do you have tips for facilitating these activities with students of a range of ages? We sometimes have tree planting events where kids from all the way from elementary through to high school join, and we're looking for activities to engage them beyond the planting and perhaps where they can, you know, work together. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite activities is from Joseph Cornell, um, Sharing the Joy of Nature with Children, where he gets as many as 50 people uh, dramatizing a tree. So what he has is some people the, with the roots, taking roots, uh, water, slurping water, carrying the water up, um, other people being the leaves. So if you want to check that out, Joseph Cornell, um, it's the, the tree drama. And if you want to email me, I can give you that link. It, it, it's a lot of fun and, and um, really gets everyone involved thinking about what a tree is doing. Because just looking at a tree, it doesn't seem like it's doing very much, but it's fascinating. And trees talk to each other through their roots, the mycelium, uh, sending chemical signals. And we're just finding out more about how trees communicate. Yeah, that's one Beautiful. idea. I've done a version of that, you know, called Build a Tree where they yes. all, and they're all either sitting or standing or lying down and being different things. Um, wonderful. Um, Emily and Shelley were both asking about toddlers or, you know, early mm -hmm. childhood. Yeah, and I think we find with little toddlers and early child, just allowing them to explore. And our temptation is often to pick kids up, but they just let them go at their own pace and uh, watch what they do and, you know, just let them, scrape the soil and take a look at what lives there, let them hold and smell things, really engage their senses. And, and yeah, that, I think that's the way to do it. And if you go to, 
we have a project called the Pathway to Stewardship, um, which you can search online. And there, there's videos that have early childhood educators giving some hints about how to connect little ones to nature. Our hope is that, you know, working with a whole bunch of different community members to try to give activities and ideas through each age and stage of a child's development so we can encourage stewardship. Pathway to stewardship and kinship. That's beautiful. And what they know they care about. Yeah, and just thinking about what to give every child through each age and stage of their development, sequentially, to grow a steward. Totally. And just noticing, that, and this is what I like when you, in the, the book of Nature Connection, and um, you kind of give the rationale before each part about why we're doing this and what that's actually going to help develop in their brains, in their bodies, in their understanding. And even from a very young age, why just noticing things, touching things is such an important part of their development. Um, so yet yeah, you can find a lot in there. Um, Elizabeth's asking about how do we get permission before picking flowers or fruits? Um, you know, I think it's sort of very dependent on where you are, would you say? Yeah, that's right. And we're lucky enough that we have lots and lots of land. So you have to use your judgment. If you're in a heavily impacted area, you might want to be really careful about that and only take things lying on the ground. But if you're in an area where there's a lot, I really believe nature is not a museum and kids need to engage and use their senses and touch and, and harvest things. Okay, again, as long as it's a responsible, honorable harvest and giving more than you take. So often I'll take along sunflower seeds and spread them or um, milkweed seeds or we'll plant something. But I really wanna talk about reciprocity. So if I take something, I try to give more back. And that's a powerful lesson for kids. But not to touch something, I feel that's sad for children. Totally. And but if you're in like an ecological nature park or in a national mm, park, yeah. you cannot pick, right? But you can go and find things that match and and leave them where they are and just look um, at them in situ. Um, but yes, as well, if you're on um yeah, it's it's always good to. Uh, ask if you're in, a, in sort of indigenous land to, to to ask for permission to be in that space or to follow sort of those principles of not taking the first bit you see or the last bit you see or not taking all of it just taking a little bit um there are some really beautiful resources out there that can support with that too um kunti asks uh can you share if you've had any experience with children with sensory sensitivities yeah Good point. I haven't had that much, but maybe others have. I see there's some really wise things going on in the chat. It's so great to be among colleagues who all have their own experiences. You're thinking about maybe on the autism spectrum where kids are extra sensitive to certain experiences. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily have any suggestions as someone else. Well, I've, I've done a lot of work with people um, with various disabilities who have different um you know diverse needs while they're out there um or who are not neurotypical in the way that they respond to things i think choice is a really big thing not forcing anyone to touch anything that they don't want to and mm -hmm. not forcing them to participate in any kind of um interaction if it makes them feel uncomfortable for example i've done uh things with silk tarps you know the the bouncing games and we play a game called turtle island where we have the turtle on and the animals and we're shaking the parachute and it's bouncing the animals off and we talk about what might cause disruption in ecosystems and what might cause that and I have a student with autism who doesn't like the feeling of the tense taut uh, parachute up against their hands uh, and so their job was to go and find the turtle and the bear and the eagle puppets these are tiny little puppets that were bouncing off and to put them back on when we get to do well what can we do to support nature what can we do to support animals in their habitat so they just have a separate job it's just as important but it might just be a little bit different i think that's my um 
my understanding. Uh, Kathy's saying earplugs and headphones can be helpful um, or um, taking it slowly. I think that's absolutely a lot of like run and shouty games um, can be overwhelming. So having that person again play a different role, perhaps where they are um, leading into a quieter place or working with you to to be a judge from a distance, for example, can be can be really helpful. And yeah, there's a few great. more suggestions closer or a little bit farther up to of uh, using like a hula hoop to make the space a little bit smaller, taking it slowly or using gloves potentially too. Great ideas. Thank you. The wonderful thing about this place. There are so many passionate and knowledgeable humans sharing together. This is what this is what these things are about, right? This is not just we speak, one expert speaks, everyone listens. This is community building at its finest. Um, you know, 370 people came to share. So thank you. Keep keep the sharing coming. Um, Andrea asked, does Camp Camp Kuatha do virtual teacher workshops from there? Yeah, I have done them before. And if you want to get in touch with me, that would certainly be possible. Wonderful. Right. I'm going to, um, and they were asking for Alberta teachers, but we can come back to that. Okay, it is five to the hour. And in my classic style, I could just keep riffing back and forth. But to um, honor everyone that might need to leave bang on the hour, because I appreciate everyone's been at work uh, or whatever it is that you've been doing today, you are joining us at the end of it. And so we are very pleased. Um, so we've got prizes coming up. Just hold on. There's a little quiz for you. Um, but first, I just want to share about our next workshop and events very briefly. So Take Me Outside Week is coming up very soon, October 17th to 21st. They have an incredible array of, uh, you sign up for free and then you get video resources, interviews, resources to do with your class to take them outside. It's a really amazing free initiative to help you take your kids outside for learning. So please check it out. Uh, if you're anywhere near British Columbia or can get there, October 21st, 22nd, we are hosting uh, a Classrooms to Communities conference. It's professional development, packed full of experiential learning, Indigenous perspectives, uh, all about place-based education. Um, so you can sign up and register for that too. Um, we have just two more. I cannot believe we're here already. Just two more um, workshops in this series. There is a little gap while we uh, conference and while we just take a moment to breathe into the new season. But Tuesday, November 15th, Teaching Green in the Elementary Years with Educators from Green Teacher. And uh, we close the season with uh, on Tuesday, November 29th with Karen Lai, uh, Accessibility in Outdoor Learning. She's a phenomenal uh, accessibility and inclusion consultant and specialist. It's uh, going to be a fun one again. Uh, I just, I guess I just should, again, reiterate, Jacob, thank you so much. So powerful, so joyful. Actually, there were so many comments in the chat about, oh, I've had a really long day and I was quite tired, uh, myself included. And you've just brought vitality and joy into this space. Uh, so thank you so much. Now, I hope to do a tiny bit of that uh, with a bit of prizes because people hopefully love prizes. Uh, I have to stop my share because I have to do this again. Oh, no, I'm set up. That's wonderful. Steph, please let me know if you can't hear. So in honor of our sensory connection here, we have four prizes. The first two winners uh, will win a $25 gift card to the outdoor learning store of course, which we'd encourage you to buy one of Jacob's fantastic resources. And the other two, uh, question three and four, are up for a $25 gift card to Take Me Outside store. They have beautiful Canadian-made, ethically produced, fun T-shirts uh, and toques and some other bits and pieces that are really lovely um, to wear while you're outside. So this is how it goes. I have a sound quiz for us today. Um, if you are hard of hearing I do apologize I will try and do it as loud as possible there is a spectrograph of the picture as I'm playing it of the sound um it's a natural sound I'm going to play it and then the first person uh in, to type in the chat uh the correct uh noise or uh sound that it is uh will win that prize so let's play so this is the spectrograph of uh, the actual sound. Sorry, I've got bars everywhere. I've got to move. Uh, here's our sound. Three, two, one, go. Or not. Three, two, one. Uh, 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 
parang nag-snort ka. Oh! I see. I saw uh, the first person to get it right, Rachel Wamsley with bison. It was bison. Amazing. And Jean, so, yes, congratulations. Very good. Very nice. You've won a $25 gift card to the store. Anyone who does win, please feel free to pop your email into a chat to Steph. Um, if not, we will find you, but uh, it just helps us. OK, second. That one really felt deep in the chest. You feel those noises rather than just hear them, right? Okay, here's our second. And here it goes. Sorry, I'm not sure if I should have done like a noise warning. <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was loud. <laughs> but it's loud in, in real life too, so. A lot of people thinking that it was a stream or rain. I'm having to actually scroll quite far. Oh, here we go. Sophia Lloyd Jones, tree fall, trees. Sorry, I won't play it again. There's the picture. Slightly blurry. Okay, well done. You've won $25 to the gift, uh, gift card to the outdoor learning store. Next up for a Take Me Outside gift. Hmm, interesting. Sort of rhythmic pattern. Let's see. Or here. We're looking for a specific, uh, how specific, Jade, do you want the answer to be? The animal, I think. I'm hoping we somebody might, oh, someone got it. I've I, seen. Sure, yeah. I mean, I saw, I saw someone say owl. Are we looking for the specific type of owl? Oh, I think I may not have updated your script or it has been updated since then. <laughs> but the, uh, <laughs> the correct answer, which is definitely in there, you might have to have a look, is porcupine. <laughs> but believe it or not, I changed it because it was a bit too specific. It sounds weirdly similar. I must tell you. Um, so, yes, the answer was porcupine. Can you find that person in there who was Sarah, top of the list? Yeah, actually, Sarah Smith. Yeah, I see porcupine. OK, congrats. And our last and final sound. And after this, I will give you the link to where I got this. This was the US, US National Park Service who recorded this. They give you all those um, uh, spectrograms of the sound and the pictures to go with it. So you can create your own quiz for your classroom for free. Um, but here's the final one. Did someone get it? Someone did. Yeah. Fiona Daniels with Rockfall. Unless you changed that one on me too, but it did sound like <laughs> Sorry, I'm terrible. Um, I just got, I kept going further down the list and getting more exciting. That was Rockfall, um, some natural sounds. I don't know if anyone's ever heard an avalanche where we live. Um, I really was like close to a large avalanche, fortunately very safe from it, but that noise of snow moving uh, at enormous velocities is quite wild. Okay, I'm very sorry. That's it for all the prizes and all the quizzes. Um, so if you do have to uh, leave us um thank you so much for joining us today um and again recording certificates um links are all going to come in a follow-up email so please check your email and uh check your spam if you haven't got something within a couple of hours and uh i'm going to go back uh, to maybe asking just a couple more questions because jacob has very kindly offered to stick around for just a little bit longer uh, so again, if you've got any more questions that haven't been answered, uh, please uh, type them in the chat now and we'll get going. I have a question for you um, as people um, figure things out uh, that I've kind of learned, but I wonder if you've got any specialist tools. What do you do when you're doing your sensory um, smell cup or building a... a a structure or something and you've got one student who finishes in 30 seconds and some of the other students are really diving deep and you know how do you handle that 
discrepancy between some students who who have different attention spans or different interests in different types of uh, activity. Yeah, I would get them to do something else, the people that are finished early and like the other people who are clearly enjoying it continue along. And yeah, the more that you just keep people engaged, the better. Any other ideas out there? Yeah, feel free to type. I have to scroll down the 9,000 uh, quiz answers. Scavenger hunting, a detailed nature sketch, have them keep going or help other children. Yeah, that's one of mine. Um, okay, this is kind of specific from Genevieve because you are um, there, um, but I feel like this, you know, Genevieve's looking for resources to teach about edible plants and berries in Ontario. Um, any field guides you particularly like and any that are, you know, more ubiquitous? Yeah, I have a wonderful edible field guide to um, harvesting plants. I can't remember what it's called. It's not very helpful, but there are many out there. And I'm sure the Outdoor Learning Store has some. Might have a couple yes we have um nature guides for your province or, or your state if you're in the us we even have some down uh for mexico as well uh and that really are just like the sort of top uh likely species species you are meant to likely to see of plants animals and birds um and it's quite interesting as well because you know for me they're not just an id tool that i use them to do literacy outside because they're waterproof and uh, bend proof and so you can look at spelling things or you can look at identifying different colors and where you see them in nature and why might the yellow-bellied warbler be yellow at this particular time of year what makes it want to do or you know how has it evolved like that in its habitat so there's lots of options yeah and for the edible wild i would just choose one that goes into a lot more detail about each plant because sometimes they'll say you can make tea out of this and that's as far as it goes but mm. you know tell me how do you do that and then what are some of the dangers so there, i've got a few great books i just don't remember what they're called i'm remembering that i'm forgetting <laughs> I'm scared that I'll forget that I would forget. And there's lots of people talking about journaling. Um, do you enjoy journaling or talk about journaling in the work that you do too? Yeah, I love journaling. And I think it's such a powerful way. And even just drawing something and taking some notes, drawing the same thing again through different seasons of the year, uh, drawing your treasures. Nature journaling is such a powerful way to connect to the environment. In fact, my fondest memories are going out with my mom, who would take a sketching when I was little. And you really see things in a new way when you draw. Mm. Your micro hikes as well sort of inspired me. I've done something with older middle school aged, even to high school age, where um, you zoom in. So you sketch the entire landscape. I put the page in four or do one page per and sketch the landscape from a wider and then zoom in into just the one plant or tree and then zoom in uh, onto the texture of that and then mm. onto perhaps one minute part of it and how much detail can you fit in one drawing and I've found that um, that has really um, inspired some of the students it's, you know don't have to be good at art because I certainly am not. Yeah, and I, I've also had a lot of fun with digital microscopes that I just plug into my laptop. And it's amazing how beautiful little things are when you blow them up. And you can ha even have a little bug walking across and it doesn't hurt it. And you can see it up close and see its mouth parts and the hair and its legs. It's amazing. Um, I just... Uh... We've coming, we're coming up on until the 10 past. If anyone else has a last couple of questions, please feel free um, to pop them in there. Um, but there I think was, what you... there was someone who was asking about any tips about saving their voice when they're doing a lot of outdoor learning oh. or outdoor teaching and learning. Yeah, I often will, if I have really rambunctious kids, I'll whisper. And it, then after a while, they get the idea and they come in close and they want to hear what I have to say. So just, I remember one time I lost my voice. I did a hike with kindergartens. It was all in whispers and it was one of the nicest hikes I've ever done. Love that. And then they're also just maybe having more space to hear what else is going on around them rather mm. than just other voices. 
lots of people talking about voice amplifiers, which I have now experienced going into schools, especially um, during COVID when we were masked as well, but they, uh, they're like little portable things and yeah, they can be really fantastic. I find I've got like a loon whistle or uh, a wooden frog that I use to draw people in from a far distance or having a call that doesn't stress your voice box so much like a wolf howl or something can be a really good way to bring them back from far away if you don't um, want to shout. Yeah, so many ideas for resources coming in there and um, really just amazing. Um, Jacob, I want to say thank you so much. Uh, yeah, yeah my, my great pleasure. So nice to see different people from all over and so great to see those different ideas coming in. What a clever think, bunch you are. <laughs> and I think just seeing the way that you uh, engage with us and how wonderful that must be out there. And you, you've sped over it as well, but the way you talked about framing the way you talk about yucky things and changing your tone and changing the language that you use, I think is a really inspirational thing that I've taken from the work that you share. Um, that's so much about how you portray it. And if you fuse it with wonder, then wonderful it does become. Uh, and this evening has been wonderful. So thank you deeply. Thank you so much. I'll say merci beaucoup if you're joining us as a francophone. Moshos gracias. Husukini for the Tanahapi voice. I'm grateful. And Lim Limt from the Snipest language here too. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, take care. Thank you all. All the best in your work.